We have tested a lot of powerful Android devices on this channel, but I'm always interested to see some of the crazy things that show up in gaming phones. In a fierce competition to win over mobile gamers, companies throw almost everything they have at this form factor. And even though I am a fan, I'm always left with one burning question. If they are this good at creating gaming phones, why are none of these companies making dedicated Android gaming handhelds? Today, we're gonna to take a look at one such company that I think could really make a big impact on the Android gaming handheld market if they wanted. Each company has its own strengths and weaknesses, but I'm gonna go over the things that I think Black Shark does well. The first thing that I think they do well is in their user experience, and Xiaomi is more to thank for this than anything else. This is my personal preference speaking, but I think MIUI is one of the top three UIs on the market today. Black Shark has some slight changes to that MIUI experience with what they call the Joy UI, but they are nearly identical in all the places that matter. The device that I'm gonna be testing today has 256 gigabytes of internal storage that is almost completely used right now for the games that we'll benchmark later in this video. Like many gaming phones on the market today, this phone does not support an SD card slot, which is a big shame. These types of phones always ship with display panels that can operate at a variety of refresh rates, and this one tops out at 144 hertz. Unlike PC gaming where you could take advantage of that high refresh rate, there are limited options on Android, but the higher refresh rate is nice to have in areas where it is supported. It wouldn't be a gaming device if we did not have some form of RGB, and the 5 Pro has a decent amount of customization that you can apply to the one on the back. I currently have my unit set to cycle through a variety of colors while the screen is active, but I also have customized the effect when the screen is off. The thing that I like the most about this light is the fact that you can have it react to the audio in the game that you're playing. This is a flex to the people around you since you can't even look at this light when you're using the phone, but I still think it's awesome, and I think they exercise some restraint by only putting one light on this phone. Continuing with the hardware and design, this back panel has some of the typical design elements that you see in gaming phones, but it's toned down a bit compared to some of the other products that you can buy. I happen to like this blue back panel a lot, and I like the way that it feels in the hand, even though I'm almost always using the included case that came in the box. All of our cameras are in the top left corner, but I have to say I haven't had a chance to do any real testing on them to see if they are good or not. I did take this 4K60 recording of a stray cat that I recently rescued, and I think the lens is decent enough, but the 1080p video is a bit softer than this. The 5 Pro also comes with a fingerprint sensor on the power button, and the unlock speed is about what you'd expect. Now it also wouldn't be a gaming phone without at least some I.O. for gaming, and the 5 Pro has two pop-out triggers that you can customize with the screen mapping software. When you pop out the triggers, you will get a haptic response, and you will also have audio played through the speaker that is closest to the trigger. The haptic system in this phone is by far the best that I felt in any Android device. I haven't had a chance to see what kind of motor they're using, but it feels great in the hand. There is a lot of customization available to you with these triggers, but the main one will open and close the Shark Space app. These gaming phones usually come with some form of a gaming UI, and Shark Space is the one for Black Shark. You have your standard application view, but the thing that I like is the fact that you have per app customizations available for everything that you add. There are two things in here that are the most important, and the first one is the performance setting for the CPU. It's not really clear what each of these modes does for the CPU, but I'm gonna be using the ludicrous setting for all of the emulation that you'll see in just a moment. I have tried playing a demanding game and flipping between these modes, and I didn't notice any big difference. You can also customize the refresh rate of the game you're playing, and this is nice to have so you don't have to worry about changing your refresh rate manually for games that support over 60 hertz. When you are inside a game, you can access the Shark Space UI by pulling down from the corner of your screen. Most of the things here are pretty standard fare, but the thing that I wanna go over is the master control option. This allows you to customize the input of the two shoulder buttons. I've already gone ahead and customized them, and if I press them, you can see that the button will light up on screen. There's also another way to get input with something called a magic press, and this will send an input somewhere else on your screen if you press hard enough on the left or right sides. There are also some gyro controls, but I haven't had a chance to use that yet. And finally, there are some options for mapping keyboard and mouse controls to your screen, but Black Shark locks that functionality behind buying their own devices. Given that this is a high-end gaming phone without a fan, I also wanted to see how it would perform in my Genshin Impact Thermal Benchmark. For the entire 30-minute test, the device never went under 60 FPS. 
The problem is that my testing application was not able to graph the thermal temperature of the CPU, but I did take screenshots to show that it topped out just shy of 60 Celsius. At this point, your device is hot to the touch, and the unscientific thermal camera shows that the surface temperature is over 50 Celsius. I attached the cooler and ran the test for another 30 minutes and the CPU temperatures dropped to 52 Celsius and the surface temperatures dropped to the mid to high 40s. The interesting thing about this test is that my GPU usage was higher on the Black Shark 5 Pro than it was on my Red Magic 7. I thought this would mean that the 5 Pro would also use more power, but I was surprised to see that it was almost using 3 watts less compared to the Red Magic 7. I also did a recharge test with the included 120 watt charger, and I got a full recharge in about 20 minutes, but I have seen faster charges online from others. So we've covered the software, hardware, and thermal performance of the Black Shark 5 Pro. Now it's time to see the gaming performance of this device. For these tests, I'm going to use all widescreen hacks and options available to maximize our screen space. Our picture is cut off a bit by the hole punch camera on the left side, but we still have a big area for emulation. I will also point out that I'm not using any cooling on this phone, so we may run into some thermal throttling issues when we get to the more demanding systems. If we run into any issues, I'll make sure to point them out as they happen. First up, we have SNES with the BSNES HD Core. Next, here's DS Performance with Drastic. I'm using the high resolution 3D option for these games. Let's move over to PS1 performance with the Duck Station emulator. I have the rendering resolution set to 5x native, and we're using widescreen hacks in PGXP. Now let's take a look at N64 performance using the Mupin 64 Plus GLES 3 core. I have the resolution set to 1080p and we're using the wide adjusted setting to fill out the screen. Staying with RetroArch, here's Dreamcast performance with the Flycast Core. I have the resolution set to 1440p, and we have widescreen hacks enabled. This computer's running wild. It won't tell me anything about the ship. The security lock is complicated. What a pain. Next up is PSP performance with the resolution set to 4x native.
Now we're moving into the demanding systems, and our first one is 3DS with the Citra emulator. We have the rendering resolution set to 4x native for these games. Here is GameCube performance with the Dolphin emulator. We have the resolution set to 1080p with widescreen hacks enabled. We are in the final three now, and it's time to look at PS2 performance. With the exception of this first game, I only set these games to 3x native, even though we probably have enough power to go higher. Towards the end of this section, I started to notice that the system was at the throttle limit. There are a variety of things that this phone can do to lower temps, but the most obvious one is that the maximum brightness on the screen took a huge dive. I noticed this at first with Battlefront 2, and it was almost impossible to see what I was shooting at, even if I was looking at the screen dead on. I cooled the device off with the cooler and tested it again, and I was able to verify that it was in fact caused by throttling. Let's move over to Wii performance with the Dolphin emulator again.
And for our final system, we have Switch with the Skyline emulator. This emulator is improving all the time, but there are still a ton of games that should one day be possible on hardware this powerful if you don't want to fork over the money for a subscription or a gamepad for another emulator. Anyway, that's it for this look at the Black Shark 5 Pro. As you can see, this thing is a beast, and I think you can see why I'm shocked that these companies are not making Android gaming handhelds. If anyone could do an amazing job, it is companies like this that are bankrolled by large cell phone companies with easy access to the best ARM hardware available. I'm interested to know your thoughts down below. Would you buy a premium Android gaming handheld from companies like Black Shark if they were to make one? If you enjoyed this showcase, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps out. Happy gaming, everyone. Talk you out.